Um, so the next topic of our program is going to be on project and proposal development and management. And the reason we wanted to, and the reason we wanted to discuss this topic with you is we've been talking a lot about proposal development um, in the first part of the seminar and in the first days of the second part here in Canada. And you may recall that once we start talking about this in the Dominican Republic, uh, we start also mentioning that, um, you know, sometimes you may have the impression that, um, you know, the hardest part is to develop the proposal, to establish the teams, and to grant the funding for your project. And sometimes you don't really worry about what comes next. But the second part is as important as the first one. How do you manage the project? How do you actually carry out the research activities? How do you achieve the goals, you know, that the proposal is claiming is going to achieve and deliver the results? How do you you know, keep the funders happy so that um, the reporting part is also important. So this, the aim of this panel is to share uh, with all of you a little bit of our experiences uh, in doing these other phases of the project from proposal to project management implementation and reporting system. So we have here four panelists that will share different phases of this uh, project experience with you. We uh, have uh, Carol Franco, who you already know. Uh, we have Kathy uh, Halverson. We have Lily House Peters and Edwin Castellanos. I'll actually ask you to introduce yourself once again, especially for our webinar participants, and uh, and share your experience. Are we going up? They're going to talk. Thank you. I get to go first. And um, introducing myself, uh, Edwin Castellanos. I'm a professor at Universidad del Valle in Guatemala. And um, I had the experience of uh, managing uh, three II funded uh, projects, starting more or less in 2001 and finishing about uh, two years ago. Uh, after I finished um, the, the projects funded by II, I actually had the, the honor of being uh, elected to the um, uh, Scientific Advisory Committee for IAI. And one year after being elected to the committee, I was elected the president of the committee. And, and so currently, I am the, the president of the Scientific Advisory Committee for IAI. And it's basically a uh, body of uh, 10 scientists um, selected by the different countries members of II, and those, um, uh, we as, uh, we as uh, a body are um, 
there to provide scientific support both to the country representatives but also to the secretariat. And more specifically, um, at the moment of, uh, of a call, the Scientific Advisory Committee uh, works closely with the Secretariat to give shape to the call and also uh, works uh, closely with the Secretariat in the process of selecting uh, the proposals. But uh, today they uh, asked me here to talk more about my experience in terms of uh, uh, project management. And uh, Marcela was saying that, uh, of course, there is a, a whole challenge of uh, putting together a proposal, uh, going through the process of uh, uh, getting, getting the funding for the proposal. That's uh, the, stage, the stage where you are at now. Um, but then once, once you succeed uh, in that uh, part of, of, of the process, then comes uh, the reality uh, shock once you once you get the money and then then you say well now I have to do what I said I was supposed to do, and that's actually not trivial because um, normally uh, in in my experience usually it will it will be um, about six months to a year between the time you wrote the proposal and the time you you got you get the money or even longer than that, and so it often happens that uh, when you get the money. Uh, to do what you said you were going to do, uh, some of the conditions uh, that existed at the time of the proposal writing has changed. And, and that actually uh, is, is important because uh, uh, sometimes those, uh, condi those conditions that have changed actually affect uh, the way that you are going to implement uh, the project. And so at that moment, you have to start a negotiation with the donor to make the donor understand, well, I told you a year ago I was going to do this and this and this, but it so happens that uh, part A of our project now is done because somebody else did it or, or something like that. No, So you'll have to start a negotiation process to make sure that uh, what you said a year ago now with the current circumstances are actually, uh, it, it, what you're going to do now is actually going to be uh, feasible with the current, current circumstances. The other uh, thing that is important to, to realize is that the, 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 um, the starting of the project, to me, is actually probably one of the most complicated parts in terms of managing the project. Um, at the beginning, again, you have this negotiation with the donor to, to get the initial funding uh, 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 from them. Uh, but then, especially in a, in a complex project like the uh, once II finance, you usually have um, uh, several institutions, four at least, or more institutions, and uh, they are usually located in different countries. And so just getting uh, all the administrative set up in order to uh, start distributing the money to the institutions might be a, 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 a big complication to um, to, to achieve, and, and, and um, oftentimes, uh, again, in my own experience, that part can take even six months, for example. So you can, you can spend a lot of time at the beginning just trying to set up all the administra uh, administration procedures to be able to give the money to the different institutions. That usually involves uh, signing uh, contracts and, and collaboration agreements with institutions. Those contracts and, and agreements are usually uh, not immediate. They, they oftentimes take two or three months because they usually have to be signed at the highest level. And so basically what I'm saying is that if you, for example, have a starting date of uh, October of, of, uh, of a given year, um, it is possible that you will, your institution will get the money not the 1st of October, that, that I, I never seen that happening. Uh, you will probably get the money, uh, if you're lucky, in November. And then once you get the money, you start doing all this process to distribute the money to the other people, institutions. So it might take two or three months before that. So it, it, it can happen that you have at least three or four months uh, within the project already, and, and the clock is already ticking, the, 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 the schedule is already advancing, but you don't have the, the resources to start. And so that, that creates some, uh, some uh, complicated situation that you have to deal with, because uh, at the end, you have to report your results, and, and you cannot just say, well, I didn't do anything because I didn't get the money. That Normally, the, 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 the funding agency is not going to be happy with that kind of report. So you have to 
to be creative there, to be able to start working even if the funding uh, hasn't arrived yet. Luckily, uh, some institutions, especially, especially the large universities, uh, have in place uh, mechanisms to help you with this. No? And so in some universities, but not everywhere, uh, they, they allow you to have a, a loan type thing, no? an advance. So if, if the university knows for sure that you're gonna get the funding, but you are just stuck with some administrative, uh, administrative procedures, the university might, might advance you the money no? and say, well, okay, you can, you can start spending money and then when the money comes in, you, you pay me back. Some universities do that and that is really helpful. So uh, do inquire with your institution if, if there is such a procedure in place because that's gonna make it very e much easier to, to deal with the situation. Because the problem is that this, this cash flow situation is worth the first year, but then it happens again every single year. If you have a five-year project, Normally, uh, at the end of year one, you have to turn in a, a, a relatively comprehensive report, and then normally the contract that you sign says that you won't get the money for year two until that report is uh, approved. And if you are sending in a 100-page report, for example, and um, uh, II then is managing 16 projects, so they get 16 reports, 100 pages each, uh, the people at the secretariat are efficient, but they cannot approve those immediately. So normally, the, the approval of reports take, again, one month, two months, and then uh, the disbursement of uh, funding for year two and year three and year four uh, therefore gets uh, delayed. So managing the cash flow uh, is always uh, a complication, and it's something that you have to be prepared uh, to deal with, for sure. And then... Um, um, together with that, I already mentioned uh, uh, the situation of producing the reports, no? especially, again, with, with a project that involves several institutions distributed in different countries. Uh, getting the reports uh, uh, together on time is always uh, um, a difficult situation no? because you are supposed to meet a deadline to send a full report but if one of the institutions, just one of them, uh, gets delayed in sending you the, the report, then that's gonna delay the whole process. No? So you have to really be on top of everybody because you are really depending on, on each other to, to be able to keep uh, on track in terms of uh, the timing uh, of, uh, of the reports. And, and, and um, it also, uh, in my experience, it also happens that, um, again, we, we had uh, four different countries, five different institutions. Um, the capacities of the different teams are different. And so oftentimes, sometimes we would get our, uh, some reports in English, some in Spanish. Uh, sometimes, uh, at, at, at first we said, okay, everybody's gonna write in English. And then we, we saw that some teams were not really that strong in terms of English writing. And so when they sent in their reports in English, he was like, uh, -uh it is, this is too difficult because it, it's gonna take more time for us to try to fix this English than to translate something in Spanish. So at, at some point with some teams, we said, well, no, let's, you write in Spanish and then we'll have to take the time to translate because it's easier actually to translate than to try to understand what somebody who doesn't uh, write well in English was trying to say. So those, those little things uh, sound trivial, but at the moment of uh, actually trying to meet deadlines, uh, do make a, uh, a a big difference, and 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 definitely um, uh, the um, the role of, of of the team leader, the role of the PI, they there is crucial, uh, and and I, I I was in that role uh, for for the three projects, so it was something like ten years. And, and every time uh, one project finished, I said, no, I'm not gonna do it again, because it was way too much work. But they, they convinced me to, to continue doing it. But it, it's definitely a, a lot of work. Uh, for me as a PI, uh, especially uh, when we were approaching deadlines for, for reports or, or, or for money uh, distribution to institutions, it was, it was easily that I would spend more time with administrative tasks than with actual scientific tasks. And, 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 and that's a, a, a load uh, on, on the PI that is, it's unavoidable. And, 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 and oftentimes those um, tasks involve not only trying to put together a report, but uh, even uh, calling and, and Skyping and be on top of people because uh, 
usually with, with this kind of setup where you have researchers in different countries, uh, n of course, this, re this, this project is only one of different things that people are doing. So, and so uh, you tell people, well, we have this deadline, please send us your report. But then you have to be calling and calling and calling to make sure that they meet the deadlines because, of course, everybody's busy with so many things. So, uh, in general, um, managing this uh, type of projects uh, is not easy. And uh, the only other bad news uh, here is that uh, whether you have a um, project that has $2 million or whether you have a project that has $100,000, if you have three countries or four countries, the level of uh, work is pretty much the same. No? So the, the amount of money oftentimes doesn't really determine the, the level of uh, complication in terms of, of administration. And so if you have three or four countries involved and you have... Um, uh, different researchers from different disciplines, you're going to have to to do all all of what I was describing, regardless of whether you have a uh, hundred thousand dollars or uh, two million dollars, and and so that's something to consider because in your case, uh, uh, you are working with uh, relatively uh, small projects in terms of, of of financing, and you will have to be prepared to to put in the time and the effort to manage uh, those projects. Um, one very last comment in terms of uh, money uh, handling or money situations. Uh, again, from my experience is that uh, different countries and different institutions have completely different rules in terms of how to transfer money, how to move money around. And some countries actually have uh, very strong restrictions in terms of uh, uh, sending in money uh, to to another country or receiving money from another country, and so those are things that uh, become uh, very important. They are non-trivial at all. If if you one of your partners is in a country, and then all of a sudden you find out that the government of that country is restricting the the amount of dollars that you can submit to to a specific institution, that can create a, a huge problem. And so the, all those situations are important to take into consideration and, and, um, and be prepared to, to, to face them. Uh, but having said all that, I don't want to end, end in a negative note. Um, all, all of these uh, complications uh, are really worth it because uh, what you gain at having a project uh, done in, in, in different countries with different uh, settings, with different visions, uh, what you gain in terms of knowledge and in terms of uh, uh, connection with uh, researchers from other areas, um, in my case, uh, completely outweighed all the effort that was required. And that's probably the reason why I kept coming back to, to say, yes, I want to do it again, I want to do it again. And I ended up doing it three times. And it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to also speak about project management, though. I'll be a little shorter uh, than Edwin. And I'm going to speak more from coming out of one of these PDS and acting as the PI for our project, um, the one that I did with Gabriella and uh, four other colleagues. And from my experience, um, it was a little interesting. We had, over the course of the project year, which we kind of had an extension to about two years, Almost everybody switched jobs. Some people switched countries, which are things that is likely to happen as early career um, scientists or early career government people. So there was a lot of flexibility that was needed in those kinds of things too. Um, we had it work out, but at times, you know, it was um, a consideration as all of you guys, you know, may move, may start PhD programs, finish PhD programs, go into jobs, move to opportunities in other countries, et cetera. Um, I want to speak about, and going off of what Edwin was saying, that sometimes, you know, six months or even a year might go by before you get funding. So what we found really important and useful was having kind of a kickoff or in-person team meeting, um, especially when we kind of received our funding and we were able to come back and say like, okay, what are our objectives? What are our research questions? What are our methods? What did we say we were going to do? Because think, you know, 
the, since eight months since you guys were in Dominican Republic so much. Everybody's so busy working on so many projects. So coming back together as a group with dedicated time, um, I can't stress enough how kind of important that was for our group and how useful that time was because we were able to finalize things like, okay, what are our data collection you know, instruments going to be what are our surveys and interview questions going to look like? What other methods are we going to use? Um, and just sit, you know, for three or four days in a room together with a big whiteboard and computers and really just have this dedicated time, which is very hard when everybody's at their institutions doing their other work. So we found that really useful. And we actually then met again um, once we had collected our data. So it was about a year later and really just sat again and analyzed the data that we had. Um, we'd all been kind of looking over it and having Skype meetings, but to just sit in a room, we kind of had a number of breakthroughs of like, oh my gosh, we didn't think about this or, you know, we had all our brains together. So we found those face-to-face -face meetings really, really helpful um, about once a year. Uh, and then with many kind of Skype meetings, um, pretty much every two weeks, I would say, we tried to meet. So that was really important too. Um, and sometimes very difficult because I know some people have, people who are in Europe, we had someone move to New Zealand. I mean, sometimes it was like 7 a.m. for one person and 10 p.m. for another time person. So it was challenging, but really keeping in contact was really important for us to remember what we needed to be doing and also to have those other people hold you accountable so that you know we didn't let kind of things get too far down the path um, with everyone busy. And I also want to say, I guess maybe two other things. One is mentorship. Um, Kathy actually was really wonderful and served um, as our mentor. And so we Skyped with her, um, I don't know, maybe once every four to six months. And we would kind of check in with what we had done send her either kind of PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we went to a couple of conferences, which also I highly recommend. Um, we met in the US at a conference and had everybody come. Um, and that gave us a really good kind of deadline to produce something. And it also then gave us kind of an opportunity to speak to our mentor and say, does this look good? You know, what do you recommend? Are we on a good path, et cetera? And so as all kind of early career scholars, we found kind of picking a mentor um, and utilizing that person's expertise to be really helpful to us. Um, and the one other thing I want to say, especially teams that have maybe a member who's in the US or Canada especially, are issues around, um, Edwin spoke about money restrictions, but we ran into some issues with like IRB issues, so the Institutional Review Board for Human Subjects Research, which is not something that exists in every country, but it does exist in institutions in the US and Canada. And so because I was the PI and our money sat in a US institution and we were doing interviews and research with people, we had to get IRB clearance and everybody on my team had to get IRB clearance. And that was hard because we had people in countries who didn't have IRB. So, um, and then we had people in Canada and they have a different system than the US. So Gabby had to go through a whole process. Um, and we had somebody on our team who had always been a natural science agronomist, never gone through, thought about human uh, subjects research. And so it was also a challenge for him to go through that process for the first time. So that actually delayed us some because we didn't really realize um, how difficult that was gonna be. I'd have a lot of meetings with our IRB board to discuss, well, in Uruguay, they don't really have this. And in Mexico, it's totally different. And in Canada, we have this issue. And so I would just say, if you have teams composed of people from different countries to really think about some of those kinds of things, because they're not trivial when you wanna start working and you realize you, you can't, that there's these barriers, so. All right. All right, thank you. I'm Kathy Halverson from Michigan Technological University in Michigan, USA. And my experience has been mostly with the United States National Science Foundation funding, but also with an IAI CRN3 grant like Edwin talked about, and also some foundation money. And I'm going to talk about keeping the funder happy a little bit and try to keep this to uh, just a very few minutes so that we can leave time for questions. Uh, Carol's going to be talking about a funding opportunity. So um, there are three reasons to be thinking about keeping your funder 
longer happy once you have an award. And Edwin talked some about the reporting stage of some of the projects he's been involved in. One reason to keep the to, to be thinking about your reporting and keeping the funder happy is it also keeps your project on track. Um, keeping the funder happy means showing that you're meeting the goals you laid out in your project. It gives you uh, the ability to say to your team members, you know, we need to meet this goal or the funder is going to be unhappy with us. Sometimes that means you won't get more money from the funder. So it keeps you on track in terms of your goals. Another reason to be worrying about keeping the funder happy and meeting the goals you laid out is that it helps the funder. There's a reason why they're worrying about you meeting particular goals, and that comes back to them also getting funding. So working with the IAI, they get their money from 19 member countries, and they, they also get a lot of money, particularly from National Science Foundation in the United States. They need to show their funders their producing outcomes. And I believe deeply in what the IAI is doing, and so I want to make sure that our team is productive so we can help the IAI show how productive they are. Um, another reason is in order to get funding in the future from that funder or other funders, you need to have a productive team. They're definitely going to be asking you about what you did with the last project and you need to show that productivity. So as you think about keeping the funder happy, it comes back to reporting um, and thinking about the goals that the funder has, but also the goals you said you were going to be meeting. And as Edwin mentioned, you're going to have periodic reporting requirements every six months, um, every year, depending on the funder. Sometimes that those are points at which you may or may not get more money. Um, and there are going to be very specific funding, excuse me, very specific reporting requirements that you have to meet. So be thinking about that and thinking about, as Edwin said, sometimes a lot of time goes by between when you submitted the proposal and when you're starting the project and when you're beginning to report. Um, and your team may not remember all of the priorities they identified, all the things that they need to do. And they especially may not remember the ones that are less important to them. Um, for National Science Foundation funding, it's very important to have underrepresented groups that are involved in and benefiting from your research project. In the United States, that's Latino students, um, African American students, Native American, indigenous um, members. And so that's not always the priority of all your team members. That's something that I've had to work really hard to make sure that we achieve. So think about making sure that you're talking about your goals and communicating that, them. Um, and science agencies will often have somewhat different goals than, say, foundations. So be thinking about that. Um, you're going to be needing, as Edwin talked about a little bit, reporting from your um, team members, especially if they have subcontracts, on what they've achieved and on how they spent their money. And that can take a long time. So uh, starting to think about that, communicating what they're going to need to provide to you, and doing that as early as you can so they can get you the information and you can submit your annual or every six month report on time is, is really helpful. Um, you may have a stage in a project where you're getting mid-project feedback from your funder. So if you have a five-year project, you may have at two years um, a time where you really have to work intensively with the funder and they tell you what's working well or what's not working well, what they'd like you to change. That can be really helpful in terms of getting your project on, on track, learning the funder priorities, um, and also getting a sense of how you can improve. So be thinking about that. Um, so I'll d wrap up my comments by kind of restating uh, the three reasons to be thinking about keeping your funder happy. One, it keeps your project on track and helps you to meet your goals. Two, it helps the funder and ensures they're going to have the ability to fund people in the future. And three, it helps you to get funding from that funder in the future as well. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carol Franco, and I'm from Virginia Tech University in the United States. Uh, I will be talking today about the Green Climate Fund, but I just wanted to make two points um, from what it was said. And it's going back to the reporting. As Edwin and, and Kathy mentioned, when you do the reports at the end of the year, every six months, they don't only have to read it. Sometimes they get back to you and ask you more questions and tell you that you missed this part or tell you that you need to submit something else. And that can take even longer. And the other thing about reporting is 
is when you go back to your project and you realize that you put in a project something that you could not measure or that you don't have the way to prove that you did it. So when you're thinking about indicators, when you're thinking about what you're going to be measuring at the end to say it was a successful project, I mean, you need to be thinking about that when you're doing your proposals. So you know that at that time you're gonna be able to go back and say, yes, we did it successfully. Yes, this is how we can prove it. So just keep those, sorry, those things in mind. And today um, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about the Green Climate Fund. Who knows what's the Green Climate Fund here? Everyone, or no? <laughs> so, the Green Climate Fund, um, the reason why I'm gonna give a brief introduction and then it's gonna be a coffee break which I'm going to ask you that even during coffee break you can start working if, if that's okay with you. And then we're going to have a, a role-playing session. Um, the Green Climate Fund is the biggest um, envir em climate fund that we have. Uh, it was set up by 194 countries uh, but under the umbrella of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it was set up in Cancun, COP, um, in the COP in Cancun, COP14. Um, it started to work to fund projects in 2015, just before um, the, we signed the Paris Agreement. And it was not just, you know, coincidence. That was the plan, that before we started with the Paris Agreement, we can have this uh, climate fund that we can start asking for funding to do mitigation and adaptation um, strategies. Important to know, this is the first fund also that includes adaptation. For the longest time, we were focusing on mitigation. So finally, we have adaptation in it. And we did have an adaptation fund, but it wasn't that much money that we had per country. So this is the first time that we have both adaptation and mitigation. And that was huge for us as developing countries. And the fund is for developing countries. So it's what your fund, the fund, the money that goes there comes from advanced economies and it goes to help developing countries mitigate or adapt to climate change. What was the goal? Why is this so big? Well, we're talking about that the idea was to mobilize $100 billion by 2020, per year by 2020. So $100 billion per year by 2020. Um, we're not there. We only have 10.3 billions right now, but we have something. And a lot of countries have pledged and made commitments. I believe um, the United States was able to put, I think it was $3 billion before um, the change in administration. So we were able to have some, uh, we were able to have some uh, funding, and each country put funding. Mexico put money, so a lot, of, even not only advanced economies, also put money into the, into the Green Climate Fund. Um, so what, what is it that we're funding? So it's 50-50, right? Mitigation and 50% adaptation. And the adaptation part, it has an extreme, or has a focus, an extra focus on small island development states because of their vulnerability and least developed countries. So when we're working in adaptation and you are working from Dominican Republic, so we have a checkbox thing because we are a small island development states. And if you're working in Haiti, you have all the checkbox because you're an island and because you're a least developed countries. And we're funding two things. Under the mitigation, you have land use and land use change and forestry and, uh, and forest, right? So you have the forest. Energy, you have um, transportation, and then you have buildings and cities. And when you're talking about adaptation, you're talking about infrastructure. You're talking about food security, water and health, livelihoods of people and communities, and ecosystem and ecosystem services. So those are the different boxes that you can submit a project to. Who can submit projects? Countries do, developing countries do. So you need to create a consortium in your own country. It can be of NGOs, academia, different actors. The best will be transdisciplinary. The best will be, which you have, private sector, if you have NGOs, if you have academias, and if you have from academia different fields. And that's really what they're looking for to make sure that happens. So when you have that and you develop a proposal, you do it in conjunction with your government or the, point, the focal point of your government, sometimes it's Ministry of Environment, in our case NDR, but it could be finance, it could be economy and planning, it depends on the country, how they decide to be the focal point. They work with you to support or not that proposal or to say yes it's a priority, you're looking at the strategies of the country, climate change policy, do, why does the country care? 
And you need to get an accredited organization. So what is an accredited organization? There's a list of organizations that went through a very, very, very due diligence process to be accredited to manage all the money and to manage and finance the project. Um, some of these are World Bank, IUCN, Conservation International is one of it. Um, a, 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 what other? The CAF, Latin American Bank is another one. GIZ is another one. So you have a list of, a, of, of, of managers, a list of accredited institutions. And what are they looking for? They're looking for ideas that will chief, shift the paradigm. They're looking for sustainability in their project. And they have categories of what they would like to fund. A, a lot of indicators, a lot, a lot. And you have two phases, the concept note phase and the proposal phase. So what we're going to do today um, I, by, in the next session is precisely we're going to take roles and some of you, which I already talked to, are going to be the secretariat of the board who are going to be, for the first time, the, the Climate Change Fund will be accepting that you talk to them and you just not send the proposals. So the secretariat will be here seeing you and listening to your proposals and the other side will be you people in your projects, we're going to name two people in the project to be the accredited organization, the accredited institution, who are going to talk to the secretariat. And I'll explain more later, and I'll have all the instructions here. But the idea is for you to see how can you explain your project in five minutes and make sure you comply with all the categories that the fund wants to see. And then the role of the board will be who will, of all the four proposals that we have here that you're working on, your real proposals, who will win the money? And we're thinking about what's going to be the price for a group. But we, we accept ideas. OK, so we have a few minutes to have a question and answer session. Could I get a volunteer from the steering committee to, OK, great. Volunteer for what? Take the mic. Okay, so I have uh, three questions, and the first two are uh, connected, so I will ask this one first. So, uh, for everyone, uh, in your big projects that you developed, did you have, did you pay someone to manage the money? I mean, uh, did you have, did you pay or did you have, did you pay or did you have anyone who, uh, was responsible to say, okay, so uh, we have some limits to, to spend money, some blocks to spend money, and you are almost in the limit here or that, or do you know what I mean? Oh, so do you know what I mean? To, uh, I had a, I've had a staff assistance with some management of some issues like that, um, and also at my university, our research staff um, is involved in keeping track of a lot of that. So, so yes, to some degree. And yeah, uh, similarly uh, with my AI projects, I um, I talked to to the donor and said this is going to be too complex to administrate, so I need you to. Uh, to approve having somebody hired to help me with the administration. So there was a person that would help me in those lines. And, and yes, usually with large projects, you have enough money that you can have somebody. Um, in fact, we, we just finished a uh, five-year uh, USAID funded initiative, and, and Gaby Alfaro was the person who was helping me manage all the and not, not, not really the everyday uh, administration, but making sure that the reports were there, done on time and things like that, no? Because again, usually universities have an office uh, that deals with those issues. And, and that's good and bad because, um, it, I mean, it's always good, but what happens is that uh, oftentimes you also have to be on top of that office to make sure that the reports are done on time. Uh, for us, it was very frequent uh, that we had the, t the technical reports ready in time, but we didn't have the financial reports on time. And so uh, having an independent office oversee all the finances is important for transparency, but it also adds to the complexity of having to deal with a separate office. And uh, how did you deal with different languages in terms of deadline? I mean, uh, did you stipulate any previous deadline 
uh, for example, you have uh, the deadline of the project of your chronogram, but you stipulate some previous deadline because you have to translate it, you have to review the grammar and the things like that. On, on the projects that I've been on, um, we have uh, had conversations in Spanish and, and sometimes Portuguese, but um, all of the people who have money are very good English speakers, so that hasn't really been an issue. Um, and they've involved six different countries, so. In our case, it was the other way around. Uh, we had everybody from Central America, but two researchers from the US who spoke very good Spanish, and so all of our meetings were in Spanish. Um, but then the reporting has to be done in English. Uh, and basically what you have to do is to develop a, a calendar knowing your deadlines, you know? And, and oftentimes what uh, happens is that if, if the final deadline to present the report is October 1st, then you end up having the first deadline uh, September 15, like uh, 45 days earlier, because you have to start consolidating and, and putting things together and translating. And so it, uh, it really moves ahead uh, all the deadlines. And, and that also creates a problem sometimes because um, it happens to us frequently that we, for example, had a, an important activity in September that we needed to include or we wanted to include in the report. But because we needed to start doing the report so early, oftentimes we had to write about an activity uh, knowing that it was going to happen, but not, not really know, uh, fully knowing what was going to happen during the activity. So it, it, it gets tricky uh, to meet those deadlines for sure. Other questions? Uh, just think, the, no? I think, yeah, we need to. I just would so like we don't have a lot of time. Regarding the last question, um, Edwin was talking about when we have deadlines, right? And when we have to give reports based on deadlines. But now most of most agencies or private sector or NGOs, they have changed. Um, now they don't give us deadlines, but they give us money based on results. So we have to give some products so we can have the money before. So that is changing, and maybe it's because this problem of the deadlines. So now they are expecting first the products, and then with the product in hand, they give us the next money. So that's complicated. That, that comes to complicate things a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to make two comments. One is, and I cannot emphasize enough, as did the panelists, uh, how important it is to uh, in your reporting to show the results. Uh, sometimes I think people take it for granted. You pay too much attention in writing the proposal and carrying out the activities, which is a lot of work. And sometimes people, because they are in a rush, they have a deadline to meet, they write you know, a report just for the sake of writing. But really having a very strong and good report is as important as delivering a good proposal. Uh, showing that you're achieving what you promised to achieve is very important because somebody's going to read their report and decide on your next flow of money or the next funding of a future proposal that you're going to submit. So just emphasizing again how important the reporting is. Um, another comment and uh, when I think somebody said in the beginning uh, when you write a proposal read the call for proposal. Read it once, twice, three times. Also read your grant agreement. Read your contract. What is written there? What is the rules and regulations of the donor agency? Sometimes people also take it for granted but you have to follow those rules. So that is as important as the call for proposals. Maybe, um, maybe you want to say something about auditing. Oh, yes. And uh, also, if your financial report is not very clear and you don't have you know, some of the reporting uh, requirements, you will be audited. And that's not good. But so even if, even if your uh, reports are clear, yeah. Yeah. with with AI, AI with many agencies, you get audited randomly. That's right. Yeah. Usually it's either random. You know, they pick samples, and they have to, we have to follow that and audit. But of course, we always if uh, we read a financial report, it's not convincing enough. 
yeah, you're going to be chosen. <laughs> you're going to be chosen to, you know, get the visit of our audit, uh, auditors. So again, reporting is very important. Not only the technical report where you're going to show your results and what you have done and what you have achieved, but also the financial report that you're spending the money according to the rules of the subgrant or the grant agreement, and that you know it's been a solid um, management of the funds of the donor agency. Uh, more questions? Anybody? So I love our research staff at my university because they protect me. They make sure that I'm not spending money in a way I shouldn't 